right, so let's look at the tenets of secure architecture and design. And these principles are going to apply regardless of the type of system that we're working with, whether it's a software-based system, an operating system, a, an application, or maybe it's a hardware system or an infrastructure system. doesn't really matter. These tenets of security are always going to apply. All right, so when we look, look at the first element, we look at how much security is enough. And when you ask that question, most people will say, oh, you can never have enough security. And that's actually not true at all. You can have too much security when security interferes with the purpose and the function of the business. And an important idea to understand is that security will always cost you something. Security isn't free. And when I trade off, what I trade off for security is either money, I have to buy security products, or performance, I lose performance when I add security. A lot of times users don't appreciate the additional security measures, and sometimes we have problems with user acceptability. We could have backwards compatibility issues, resource availability issues, there could be all sorts of problems. So the bottom line is, when we answer the question, how much security is enough, the answer to that revolves around risk mitigation, well really risk analysis. Figuring out what the potential for loss is, how much security is necessary, and finding that proper balance between cost and benefit. And as a matter of fact, when we look at a cost-benefit analysis, most of the decisions we make in this world are on cost-benefit analysis. What are the benefits to me? How much is it going to cost me? What's the trade-off? Is there more value than there is cost? And if so, we generally make that choice. All right, so how much security is enough? That's driven by risk analysis. Next issue, defense in depth. What one mechanism will protect your house or your home from a burglar? Now, if you think about that, I'm going to give you one mechanism to protect your house. You know, sometimes I'll hear, hear people say door locks. Well, locks can easily be picked. Well, how about a guard dog? Well, I have a pug, so I can tell you the truth, absolutely worthless in the event of a robbery. But, uh, and actually not really worthless, he does provide deterrence because he'll bark a lot. Uh, and he might be part of a, a, a more comprehensive defense system, but in and of him itself, the pug prevents no robberies. Well, what about an alarm system? No, you've got minutes before the police show up. Uh, I hear people joke and say, Smith & Wesson, a gun is going to be my defense mechanism. Guns backfire. Guns can be wrested away. Um, so the point I'm trying to make is there is no one mechanism that's going to protect your home in the event of a disaster, in the event of an attack. So what do we do instead? We have defense in depth. I have a fence, I have motion detector lighting, I have the attack pug, I have um, uh, locked doors, I have uh, locked windows. So the idea is we don't rely on a single mechanism, we look for security to come in layers. One mechanism on top of the other on top of the other. And that's defense in depth. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as a layered defense. Alright, the next element, fail safe. A system should fail in such a manner that it protects itself. You know, uh, uh, if you've ever seen the Microsoft blue screen of death, and I'm sure we've all seen that, that's the system failing in such a way that no further compromise can happen. Because when you do get that blue screen, what else can you do? Can you copy? Can you open up files? Can you export or import? You can't do anything. So that system is responding to a security vulnerability in such a way that no further breach can happen. Economy of mechanism. Keep it simple. Rather than having, um, you know, a network design that's so elaborate and complex, it's much easier to secure a simple design. I'd rather have to protect two doors than 30. Right, so we keep our design logical and straightforward. We keep it simple because a simple design is easier to protect. Keep it simple. 
completeness of design. We make sure that we provide security all the way throughout the life cycle of the software and we make sure that within any system the, the there is an equality of security throughout. You know from a physical security standpoint if you've ever been to a building that has a security guard up front, swipe card access, all those things and then you walk around back and the loading dock is open that's what we're trying to avoid here from a software perspective. We want a good Good, complete security design. Least common mechanism means take advantage of what's already out there so you don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel again and again. Open design, there are two schools of thought with the design of, of software and, and with, with uh, the design of most systems. Do I publish and make this information known? Do I publish the code for my operating system or my protocol? Do I make the details public? Or do I hide them? Do I keep them to myself? So of course the first was open architecture, the second is closed architecture. Sometimes when we see closed architecture we think about the phrase security through obscurity. And what that means is, I think because you can't see it, you can't compromise it. That's like me saying I've put my uh, house key under my mat, you can't see it, so you can't compromise it. And that's not true at all. So as a general rule, we prefer open architecture because that allows for peer review. Now I'll tell you that doesn't guarantee peer review will happen. And if you're familiar with the issues with open SSL, it really wasn't being reviewed properly. So just making software open does not make it more secure but it can make it more secure if the review happens well. Um, consider the weakest link and if you were to think about the weakest link in your organization what could you tell me? Where's your weakest link? And if you thought of the answer people or employees or internal users you're absolutely right. So when we are looking to design a system we have to consider that we protect users and not all of these errors and these uh, compromises are malicious. Not all users are malicious but it doesn't take a malicious user to delete a key file or to uh, destroy the integrity of information. So we always want to think about our users and restricting the damage that users can do. Redundancy Absolutely. We want to avoid a single single point of failure. So we want to design a redundant system that can withstand um, uh, one element perhaps not working. We want to be able to have backup mechanisms. Redundancy goes back to the phrase, don't keep all your eggs in one basket. Okay. So more than one, we, we don't want a single point of failure basically. Uh, psychological acceptability, meaning your security is not so intrusive that users don't want to participate. Because if security is so complicated that a user doesn't want to do it, that user will find a way to bypass it. And I would so much rather see users on my side than users trying to find a mechanism to bypass the security I put in place. Also remember security is here to support the business function. If users are having such a difficult time doing the things that they need to do in order to perform their business function then I'm probably not meeting the goals of, of uh, my organization. Alright, separation of duties. Uh, separation of duties is going to make sure that no one individual has too much power within a system or within an environment. So rather than having a single network administrator, what we would prefer to do is have multiple network administrators each assign certain roles and certain permissions and certain rights. Uh, if you work in an organization, we don't want the same person that prints the paychecks to sign the paychecks. That's a conflict of interest. So separation of duties should help us with that. Other things, and these aren't necessarily essential to software design, but some other ideas for security, uh, things like mandatory vacation and job rotation, um, making sure that we have detective mechanisms in place so that no database administrator, for instance, is the only one that touches their system. We want to allow other people to come in for investigative purposes and detective purposes and make sure that nothing fraudulent is happening there. 
least privilege and need to know. We have to follow those principles absolutely positively as much as possible. The principle of least privilege says, I'm going to give you just the bare minimum of rights and activities that you need to do your job. Nothing more, nothing less. So when we talk about least privilege, that's about action. What can you do on the network? When we talk about need to know, that's about data. That's about what can you access. So you don't get to access the sales folder because you're not a salesperson. That's need to know. You don't get to change system date and time. That's principle of least privilege. All right, and then the last element, dual control. That's another good idea. And what dual control revolves around is the idea that there are some activities that are so um, potentially harmful that we don't allow a single uh, individual in the network to do those activities. For instance, recovering keys for my users. Well, if I can recover your private key, then I have your private key. And the whole purpose of a private key is to be bound to your identity. So that kind of gets us out of true authenticity. So what we might do is rather than letting me, Kelly Handerhan, recover your key, we may require two network administrators to be present before the key can be recovered. And we refer to that as dual control. Sometimes you see the old war movies where the madman's getting ready to launch the bomb and he goes down in the control room and there's a key uh, that needs to be turned on each side of the room. And since it's on the different sides of the room, no one individual could turn the keys at the same time. And that's a good idea or good example of dual control. So you can get the feel at how all of these elements come together and we have to consider them for any type of system design that we're doing. When we talk about secure uh, system engineering, what we're looking to incorporate into our design are all of these elements. So I hope this is helpful. Uh, our next section we're going to move through and talk a little bit more about system architecture as a whole.